This is Chuck. Hi. <laughs> Chuck from Midori Farm. What are we doing today, Chuck? We're going to be planting out these onion starts. Ooh. Hi, this is Joy from Inbound Ambassador. This is a Seeking Sustainability live follow-up with Chuck Kayser at Midori Farms, an organic farm in Shiga, not far outside of Kyoto. Chuck was a guest in the Seeking Sustainability Live series at the end of July, is episode 67. You can hear Chuck talking about farming and composting. And when I visited him at his farm in Shiga, he gave me so many more insights into what you need to do to run a successful organic farm in Japan. All right, so we are at Midori Farm in Shiga, Shiga Prefecture, right? Shiga Prefecture. And this is Chuck. Hi, I'm Chuck from Midori Farm. <laughs> what are we doing today, Chuck? We're going to be planting out these onion starts. Ooh. And I've got uh, six or seven different varieties, about 50 or 100 of each. We've already got 200 in the bed, and this is going into the bed we just pulled all our sweet potatoes out of, which was about, uh, yeah, probably about 150 kilograms of sweet potatoes this year. That was our community wow. farm project. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're going to put onions in. Onions are something I, I never grow. I grow green onions, or scallions, or negi in Japanese. Those are pretty simple. But uh, proper onions, they take really long time. It's like a six to nine month enterprise growing onions properly. And uh, they're the monkey's favorite and we get a heavy snow. So these are things that are kind of weighing against me for growing onions. But this year I decided to have the extra field. I've kind of gotten the monkeys under control maybe, so we're gonna go for it again. So it's a $100 risk to try to see if we can get, uh, I don't know, maybe 500 onions out of this 800 start. So All good. right, great. Yeah. And we're at a beautiful location. How many fields do you manage? Four. And this is one of them? <clears throat> this is my first one actually. This is how the whole thing started. I don't know if you heard the origin story. You, you, I think you did. Like, yeah, I wanted to buy, maybe. I wanted to buy this land to build a log cabin, uh, just as a vacation place for, for myself and my family. And uh, I negotiated the price. It had just lain empty for years. And uh, unfortunately, it was zoned in properly. Because this, this area is like this in Japan, these rural uh, neighborhoods and, and villages. Like, they've been around for 15, 20 generations. And this land was belonged to this mountain, which is belonged to that man over there, and probably one of his great, 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 great grandmothers or grandfathers married a great, 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 great grandmother, grandfather from over there. And because they got married, it's like, okay, we're gonna, for the wedding present, we'll give them a little piece of land to build a house on or to farm on or something. So the land was just kind of been like, okay, here between two people, a handshake or a bow or whatever it was back in those days. The documentation wasn't official, and nobody cared about it because it's so rural. But then once it goes into the sales process and you have to go to the office, they're like, oh, we got to drop an official document, we got to zone the property, plus $5,000, and I said, I have to pass. And the guy said, oh, I feel so bad, just use it as a farm, and that's how that whole thing, this whole thing, the dairy farm started. So. Great. Yeah, right now there's just some salad greens and some uh, chrysanthemum for, for salad and uh, some sage uh, growing on here. Because <clears throat> basically the sun's not out today, but by 11 a.m. the sun's off the farm. So not a lot can really grow here. And it's open. The monkeys can get in, the deer can get in, so I'm restricted into what I can grow here. But lettuce and stuff like that is pretty simple. So. It's, uh, that's what I'm growing here now. So your biggest nemesis is the monkeys? For sure, for sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They'll come and eat everything? They do, they do. I mean, they don't eat lettuce. In fact, as far as I can tell, humans are the only organisms that eat lettuce. Wow. Even the bugs leave it alone. The ra I mean, a rabbit would probably eat it, but, you know, it's, it's a funny thing that we love lettuce and almost nothing else does. <laughs> <laughs> and you can farm here all year? No, no. In the winter time, the snows get pretty heavy, historically. Last year was an odd year. We only got a foot of snow, about 30 centimeters, um, which is just shocking for everybody that they're used to a, a, a meter of snow at least, you know, about three, three and a half foot. Almost nothing last year, and it was so short that 
the whole ecosystem was like, what's going on? The insects woke up earlier, the birds came back sooner, and I could start growing sooner. So it was a longer season for me this year, which is good, I guess, but it's terrifying to witness climate change firsthand like that. Yeah, for sure. So this is coming to the end of your farming season then? It is, yeah. But actually, I'll far I always farm through about the end of December. I usually have to dust the snow off my daikons and cabbages so for the final harvest. But, uh, you know, that's just part of it. So you'll see, you'll see later that I'll show you all my, my younger stuff. If you want, we can take a walk over to two. Great. Have a look over there. Yeah. And just there, before the little fall, we have usually six to ten baskets in the summer full of our, our fresh greens because we don't have a walk-in refrigerator. So we put them into a basket, sink them with a stone under the water, and that keeps them cool and kind of cleans them a little bit. So this river is a vital source for us for a lot of things. And just up around the bend, there's a, a two-meter hole where people go swimming in the summer. It's amazing. Wow. So and there's, there's not many farms using pesticides around here that would kind of pollute the river? Well, this village is like a lot of villages. Most of the residents are elderly. You know, not just older, but elderly. Um, 70s to 80s. And so there's not a lot of farming done, being done. There's some gardening being done, um, but not really big farm. Um, the rice fields here are managed with chemicals, I'm sure. Um, but they're managed with kind of a, a co-op sort of system. Whereas the gardeners here, some of them use chemicals, or most of them do, but they're few and far between, so it doesn't really affect me. Yeah, I uh, talked to a bee farmer, and oh. he said he can't be anywhere near rice farms because yeah. of the pesticides. Yeah. And even being near houses with house chemicals mm -hmm. is bad for the bees, so How he chooses right next to the forest. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I've thought about having bees, even just, I have carpenter bees a lot, which are uh, kumabachi, uh -huh. kumabachi um, which are wonderful pollinators. They don't produce honey, of course, but they're wonderful pollinators. Farm over here, if you want to use it, I don't mind. And I'm like, sure, and it was bigger, better, more light. So this was really what made Midori Farm start. Mm -hmm. The great students of Worcester Polytechnic Institute uh, came out last year and helped me design this for actually a composting system. And at the end, I'm like, could we put a monkey fence on there? They're like, sure, no problem. And I'm like, yes. And it's made a huge difference for me, for peace of mind and for much more vegetables. Because the monkeys will just clean me out. And it really works, keeps them out. So far, so good. I hate this. I hate to jinx it. You know, as soon as I say that, I'll come back next time and I'll be gone. But yeah, so far, so good. Can I go in? Yeah, go ahead. So you're growing quite a lot. Is that carrots? Those are carrots. Those are big, big carrots. Yeah, good. Um, this is uh, this trellis I made this year. I love it. It's my bean trellis. And I grew Morocco beans, which are awesome. So good, one of my favorite beans of all time. Um, and I built this for it and I extended it in the fall. And now I'm growing uh, lima beans, no, no, fava beans, uh, Morocco beans, and oh yeah, and lima beans, that's right. No, 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 Kentucky Wonder, that's right. I didn't do the limas, I did Kentucky Wonder. And they're all climbers, so they just love this thing. And you can see the ones at the far end, they're kind of getting up there about a meter or so. And then, do you know what this is? Uh, negi? No. No. <clears throat> now, if you look closely, this is a patch of negi. Okay. Okay, you see how the negi grows like this? This is growing single stalk, but it's in the same family as them. You know, it's, mm. it's garlic. Ah. And garlic will grow up about a foot or a foot and a half or about 30 or 40 centimeters. Uh, in in how long? Fall. And then the snows will just, okay. you know, cover it for three months maybe. And then in the springtime they'll come back and they'll be harvestable probably in late June. So it's about a nine month crop, much like proper onions. But everybody loves garlic, so it's, it's worthwhile. I notice you're right next to the forest, mm -hmm. which is beautiful. Do you ever see any bears? I have seen one bear in about 18 years coming wow. up here. Yeah. And it wasn't around here, it was over near where we saw the monkeys. I saw the signs as I'm driving up and I'm thinking, hmm, how many I think that's bears? mostly for hikers okay. to give them the, the heads up that bears are around. But they're not the dangerous uh, brown bears. They're the really timid, shy, smaller black bears. So, I mean, I'm not saying I would want to go up against one or startle one, but they're not so dangerous. 
And then here we have uh, red Russian kale coming up. I love pit growing kale. It's one of the most sustainable crops possible because it's so um, productive. It's so super easy. It's like bulletproof. You can't really mess it up. And it's one of the healthiest things for our body. So it's like a win-win across the board. And I encourage people to eat and grow more kale. And then, of course, we've got flushes of carrots through here. Um, a couple of different kinds. We'll pull one in a minute, and I'll show you. Now, do you recognize this plant here? No. What is that? This is a perennial. Do you know what a perennial means? Only seasonal? It means it'll come back next year. Oh, okay. And go again and again and again. So trees are all perennials. Most vegetables are annuals, which means they grow one year or one season, and that's it. Uh, but these are perennial. They're soil born. They're they're important to grow up the plant above ground because what's most important is the root structure get really well established because from next year it'll be three years old and then I can start cutting the little sprouts, which are asparagus. Nice. Wow. I wouldn't imagine that was asparagus. Well, if you've ever walked past like an asparagus farm or an asparagus garden, you'll see that. Yep. Somebody let one, missed one, and it got really big. I mean, they get really big like this pretty fast. Oh, wow, look at the colors. Wow, that's gorgeous. Yeah, I love lettuce, it's so pretty. So this is ready to harvest? Do you, it grows a bit bigger? Uh, yes, both, yes to both. I'll probably take a few today, and uh, that'll give space to the others to grow. But, uh, if I wanted to just grow it bigger, I could just let it keep growing. I just recently took out my green beans here, you can see the pile, um, and then I planted everything. Farmers are, I mean, if one thing farmers have an abundance of, it's, oh, I've got a little bit of this seed, a little bit of that seed at the end of the season, so I took all my spare head lettuce and spare spinach and spare salad greens and even some turnips and radishes and I just spread the seeds here and I'm going to just grow up a nice salad mix. So this is kind of the cut and come back kind of stuff. You nice. Know, you just let it grow about 50%. And then you cut it. So even this time of year you can still be planting things? And... Well, this was done two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So um, that was pretty much the end of it. I mean, something like radishes, which are 30 days, you could probably get another flush of radishes if you had a nice warm day so they could germinate, and then you had a bed that gets enough sun. Um, but otherwise, no, I can't plant anything else. And this is all daikon here? That's correct. That's daikon under the net. Again, I could take that net up any time, leading into some... Cabbage? Uh, some cabbages, and then some broccoli. Yeah, this is where my okra was. Oh, okra. And, uh, I was able to actually start my daikon while the okra was still big and tall. Nice. And then uh, when the okra started to die, I would just cut it off and then don't disturb the soil. So that... And you've got tomatoes in the back. Right, which are also pretty much done. I'll, I'll collect all the green ones and try to make a salsa or something for the mm. customers. Fried green tomatoes. I've never been <laughs> successful at making that. I've never tried either, but I always think of that when right. the tomato doesn't go red. Exactly. And you got some peppers over there? Right. And those are the spicy ones. The I've black got, ones are spicy? I've, those are jalapenos, which oh. actually aren't spicy this year. Oh, yeah? I missed it somehow. But then I've got the eagle's claw, which are kind of the ones that grow up. Uh-huh. Those are takanotsume. They're pretty. Japanese kind of cayenne-style pepper. Then I've got some Korean kimchi-style peppers there. And I had a habanero and a scotch bonnet. The scotch bonnet died, but the habanero I, brought, I, I took out put in a pot and brought it home. I want to try to overwinter it. Peppers are, are perennials, which you remember means they will grow come back every come year. Back every year, you don't have to replant them. Correct. Okay. But growing them out in a, in an area that gets a true winter, the plants are just going to die. I right. mean, peppers, like a lot of our vegetables, are from South America, which in places doesn't have any winter at all. So these peppers grow much bigger and much faster and much better. The first year you grow a pepper out, it takes so long. It takes like six months to finally fruit. And then, so if you can overwinter it and put it back in the spring, it'll take like two months. And then suddenly you get way more peppers in that year. So that's, that's the goal with the habanero. I'm going to try to overwinter it and see if I can replant it out next year and get a whole bunch when more. When you say overwinter it, you mean take it home and keep it warm? Take, that's right. Yeah, I put it in a pot and I keep it in the house or near the house and I water it and give it enough light and just make sure it's doing okay. Because um, it's not going to produce anything. It's just going to be a plant. And then hopefully next year it'll come back.
Great. Yeah. Nice to spice it up. Have some peppers. And over on your far right here, this kind of structure I mm -hmm. built uh, with a net over it. I was growing out my heirloom tomatoes oh. uh, in containers. Tomatoes are really fussy um, as far as wanting the correct soil every year. Uh huh. And um, if you grow tomatoes in the same place year after year, you're going to be killing them with diseases because tomatoes are so pr disease prone. So it was my idea to actually make a little greenhouse over here to protect them from water uh, because tomatoes also don't like to have too much water. And plus a lot of the diseases come when the rain hits the soil, splashing it up onto the leaves. So tomatoes are big babies, basically. They're fruits, first of all, so that means they're, 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 they're really picky about what they like. They're divas. Right. They are divas. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> so basically the idea is in containers, next spring I'll take that soil and I'll dump it into a different bed, take soil from a different bed, fill the, those up. So I'll be kind of rotating the soil. Big thank you to Chuck for the farm tour and the farm experience. I volunteered helping him plant some of the green onions negi after this filming. Chuck is so knowledgeable and explains things so well. I would highly recommend going out for one of his volunteer days. You'll learn a lot and you'll be able to really enjoy this beautiful countryside area. Hi, this is JJ Walsh. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you're interested in this series, take a look at inboundambassador.com where you can also find out information about the YouTube channel. Please like, subscribe, comment, and share. It really means a lot. If you'd also like to become a patron, uh, there's information how to financially support and get some bonus tracks and behind the scenes info. Thanks a lot. Take care. Have a great day.